TJ Demos, our next speaker, who I'll be introducing shortly, will be taking us to an even darker place, I think. Um, sometimes we need to go to these depths of darkness in order to re-emerge. Um, so uh, just leaving that aside, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, TJ to, to all of you, if you don't know of him or, or his work. Uh, he's a professor in the History of Art and Visual Culture Department at UC Santa Cruz, and he's the director of the Center for Creative Ecologies there. Um, TJ writes widely on mo modern and contemporary art, and his essays have appeared in too many magazines, journals, and catalogs worldwide for me to list. Uh, he's incredibly prolific, um, a real inspiration for a lot of people like myself who are caught up on contemporary art. Uh, Professor Demos's research focuses on the political dimensions of contemporary art and visual culture with particular attention given to the diverse ways that artists and activists have negotiated crises associated with globalization, including uh, the emerging conjunction of post 9 11 political sovereignty and statelessness, the hauntings of the colonial past and the growing biopolitical conflicts around ecology and climate change. And he's really been at the forefront of actually writing from the point of view of art history, a very small discipline. Uh, probably many of you don't think it's that important. That's fine. Uh, but he's really um, led, he's led the charge in that respect when it comes to thinking about uh, ecology and climate change. And his latest book, Against the Anthropocene, uh, TJ makes a compelling argument not only against the periodization of a human-centered geological age, but the idea that the environmental problems unleashed by climate change can only be solved by massive technological countermeasures. One frequently hears claims, absent of any irony, that it would take an equivalent of the Manhattan Project to save the planet. And in fact, many of the proposed schemes for geoengineering would be undertaken with the resources of guess who? The US Army, right? So on that note, <laughs> and uh, TJ challenges, he wants to challenge this narrative, and I think his talk today will definitely be moving in that direction. But it's not just a question of trying to attack that narrative. Um, it's also opening up room for alternative futures ones that come out of a critical engagement with an intersectional culture of climate ju justice that we've been actually seeing uh, throughout the various presentations in this symposium. So please welcome TJ Demos to Dartmouth. Thanks so much, Chad. Uh, and it's a, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so this is my uh, presentation. I'm going to begin just with an anecdote, and then I'm going to show a, a film um, or a video uh, that's about eight minutes long that I'm focusing my analysis on today. And I'll, I'll talk about that film by Arthur Jaffa uh, called Love is the Message, the Message is Death. I'm just curious, has anyone seen it in here? OK. Um, so it's, I think it's worth watching again, even if you have seen it, um, many haven't. And um, it, this, is, this offers a, uh, an opportunity to talk about some, uh, like an intersectionalist approach to uh, environmental studies that I think is really important today. I, so the anecdote is I had a, was talking to a grad student the other day, um, um, one of my students, Cynthia Issa, and she was, um, she was, questioning me about a, a remark that I made in my book, uh, Decolonizing Nature, where I, where I said something to the effect that climate, the, 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 the struggle or the, the challenge of climate change is, is um, historically singular, unprecedented, and it's the biggest one that we face today. And she was, she was uh, asking me if that wasn't a kind of, um, prob if it didn't problematically universalize this, this issue, and was it not a reflection of a certain privileged and secure position within the academy uh, in California that I could ask that, or I could make that kind of assertion? And I said, well, what, <clears throat> what, you know, wh where isn't it? Where isn't it the biggest uh, challenge that you can think of? And she said, well, because um, she comes from Lebanon, so she, she said, uh, Gaza. 
uh, and in Gaza, an open-air prison under Israeli occupation. People are worried on a daily basis about eating uh, food, getting clean water, being shot, arrested, or killed on a daily basis. Uh, and my response to her was, how does that not have to do with climate? It really lets, I think it completely depends on how we define uh, these terms. So my presentation today will make a, a proposal for how we might rethink conditions of uh, climate and environment in, in this larger uh, context with, with some uh, speculation on um, ways of thinking about the future. So this is, this is uh, Love is the Message of the Message of Death. This is a viewing copy by Arthur Jaffa. He's an Amer African-American uh, filmmaker and cinematographer. Uh, you might know him from some previous work that he's done uh, on Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash, an important experimental independent African-American film. He's also done cinematography for Black Audio Film Collective. Uh, based in uh, London when they were uh, still working and uh, has worked with John Acomfra also. Uh, so this is from 2016, Love is the Message, the Message is Death, a viewing copy. So this comes in uh, eight sections. Uh, the Anthropocene is proving to be an era of world war, or rather worlds at war. Not that that's anything new. We're no doubt living in the continuation of long-standing onto-epistemological and political-military conflicts set within still unfolding histories of colonial and global states of violence and dispossession. If catastrophe lies before us, then it flows from what's come before. Consider two formations that speak to our current situation. First, uh, geoengineering's techno-utopianism which is premised on climate change fixes for the symptoms of fossil capital's disastrous centuries-long effect on the environment. Uh, this is just an image uh, from uh, online that shows you a variety of different geoengineering <laughs> proposals. Adherence suggests that solar radiation management and carbon capture, the two dominant forms of climate engineering, can stabilize temperatures so as to avert calamitous environmental transformation. With reference to such an approach, the Breakthrough Institute, based in California, offers a futurist vision of what they call the good Anthropocene, articulated as a coming world where, in their words, humans use their growing social, economic, and technological powers to make life better for people, stabilize the climate, and protect the natural world. The second formation that I want to con consider is the tragic and redemptive Afrofuturism appearing in Arthur Jaffa's shattering 2016 video, Love is the Message, the Message is Death. As one model among numerous indigenous and anti-colonial futurisms embedded within social movements dedicated to justice to come, and, and we've heard about a couple of models there from Will Wilson, for instance, and Laura and Calzadilla are two that come to mind that I've looked at previously and thought about and tried to think with. Um, the video foregrounds the heart-rending violence of the state against communities of color as the fundamental basis upon which any alternative, one of coexistence, equality, love, and peace, can be imagined. Following the impulses behind the 2016 Movement for Black Lives platform, itself built on long-standing African-American approaches uh, to environmental justice that insist on correlating existential vulnerabilities with racial and economic inequalities. It's crucial to bring these politico-ecological strands together, I'm arguing, in intersectionalist analysis. These two modelings of the future offer an expedient comparison and also startling contrast between the current techno-scientific rationality of climate change response and the socio-environmental justice or injustice, concerns around racial capitalism. As such, the unlikely connection invites a much needed discussion of futures that could potentially be locked in for hundreds, even hundreds of thousands of years. While climate science tends to ignore, or at best merely pays lip service to the differential impacts of environmental transformations on disenfranchised communities subject to ongoing racial and economic determination, 
Social justice activism often shunts ecological matters to the side due to an all too immediate confrontation with uh, discrimination and violence. So what's at stake in this unlikely linkage? I think everything that matters. Two, Jaifa, a filmmaker by trade, unleashes an archive of citizen journalists, dash cam, and media videos wherein we see the black body subjected to police brutality and state violence. Set to Kanye West's transcendent gospel rap anthem, Ultralight Beam, the video cycles through recent and historical footage of shootings, abuse, attacks, and beatings, intermixing clips of horrific civilization-destroying aliens and monsters from Hollywood films. It appears that Jaffa's video concerns not only the world of victimized individuals, but a world set on destroying itself, an allegory for the destruction of the world that, in a parallel universe, geoengineering wishes to repair. My 2017 book, Against the Anthropocene, criticizes the Anthropocene thesis for its regressive and narcissistic neo-humanism, its evasion of the differential causes and effects of climate breakdown, its disavowal of petrocapitalist culpability, and its ecology of affluence, which is not unrelated to this drama of self-destruction. That analysis extended to diverse visual cultural expressions of remote sensing data, the kind that offers whole earth perspectives of the planet as not only devoid of social conflict, but also safely in the grips of an emergent scientific mastery. These observations still plague theories and the unfolding reception of the Anthropocene today. Despite parallel attempts in a variety of different sites, uh, to mobilize it critically or work progressively within its conceptualization and also nominate additional terms like the capitalocene or the thulocene to better comprehend current conditions. Geoengineering, in fact, unfolds directly from the Anthropocene thesis. Um, so just a little bit of the history here. Uh, beginning with the initial 2000 proposal made by the atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen and the biologist Eugene Stormer, two of their papers you see here, to designate a new geological era where Earth systems are increasingly determined by human, so-called human activities. As they explained, an exciting but also difficult and daunting task lies ahead uh, of the global research and engineering community to guide mankind toward global, sustainable environmental management. Crutzen soon followed up with more explicit suggestions that large-scale engineering projects, including his own one for stratospheric sulfur injections, uh, may well be necessary to optimize the climate. Much dispute <clears throat> remains over the dating of this post-Holocene epoch, and we've already heard a little bit about this today. Whether it began with the 19th century industrial revolution or nuclear science in the 1940s, or again, much earlier with the Orbis spike of 1610, which I think is an important, really important proposal. This latter coincides with the geological implications of colonization and genocide in the Americas, which also unknowingly dropped atmospheric carbon levels thanks to large scale afforestation uh, of once cultivated indigenous lands. Its apparently causal connection to geoengineering today shows that the Anthropocene as a discourse uh, is not only far from innocent in historical diagnosis, right? It matters both geologically and politically when we date it, but it's also preemptive in techno-scientific prescription for future response. So the Anthropocene in a way is mapping out a future. We need to uh, pay attention to what, it's, what, what ideological work it's doing how it's preempting the future. For Crutzen, engineering may be a last resort to forestall catastrophic breakdown of the Earth's systems, where reducing emissions proves insurmountable. But for others, however, and increasingly, it re represents an attractive first option to advance ecological modernization, merging climate solutions with economic opportunity. So this is, this is following up on my, on, the, on my research that I did for the Against the Anthropocene book, and I'm finding that it's really 
um, striking to what degree these, you know, this, this, uh, this kind of development is occurring uh, and gathering uh, massive amounts of resources. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about that uh, in what comes. So this becomes explicit, for instance, with the Breakthrough Institute's notorious proposal for a good Anthropocene, founded on the dubious, what they call decoupling of economic growth from environmental impacts. So, so that, that's a quick sentence, but that's really crucial for green capitalism that, who, that believes that we can decouple economic growth from environmental impacts, as if we don't, you know, as if there's no contradiction between endless economic growth uh, and climate solutions, right? So this, the Breakthrough Institute, this leading big money and anti-green, pro-nuclear and pro-geoengineering think tank in the US was founded in 2003 by Michael Schellenberger and Ted Nordhaus. In their 2004 essay, The Death of Environmentalism, Global Warming Politics in a Post-Environmental World, Schellenberger and Nordhaus sought to dispatch what they termed the politics of limits. In other words, the kind uh, of environmentalism based in the regulatory activism of the 1970s that emphasized Earth's finite caring capacity. And they're trying to replace it with what they call a politics of possibility, committed to technologically driven economic growth put to task against climate change. They count Carl Page, the brother of Google farm, uh, founder uh, Larry Page, among its funders, indicating the growing convergence of big tech with green economics. According to critics, the Institute remains singularly dedicated to propagandizing capitalist technological investment solutions to climate change. The clearest articulation of their position is an eco-modernist manifesto. You can find all this online. Written by 18 authors, including Schellenberger and Nordhaus, which advances their techno-solutions-based goal, uh, which they articulate as the following. More productive economies are wealthier economies, capable of better meeting human needs while committing more of their economic surplus to non-economic amenities including better human health, greater human freedom, and opportunity, arts, culture, and the conservation of nature. Despite its familiar trickle-down economics and liberal coded goodwill rhetoric, the manifesto's expansive spatio-temporal scales and abstract rhetoric, like much of the Anthropocene thesis's planetary imagery and deep time frames, overshoot the figural the local, the experiential. It's not surprising then that its so-called politics of possibility fails to mention the terms race, equality, justice, which would help connect to the actual antagonisms of current social experience, while the lofty and generalizing language of human, technology, and growth abound. By evading such key facets of justice-based environmentalism, which they do their best to consign to the grave, eco-modernism's colorblind formulations reflect yet another version of what the journalist Van Jones has called the unbearable whiteness of green. <laughs> Here, that's doubly unbearable because the manifesto's enviro-economic utopianism fails to consider the intolerable social conditions of current reality. By disappearing them in its performance of an ecology of affluence, that's the term of Ramachandra Gua in the Indian context, it implicitly seeks to protect its own privilege. Alternately, if we can describe Arthur Jaffa's video as expressing an environmentalism of sorts, which I argue we can, even though the video's reception to date within largely art criticism has largely evaded such an analysis, uh, art criticism as well as in black studies. Uh, but if we can say that Jaffa's video uh, expresses an environmentalism of source, then I think it's one attuned to what Christina Sharp terms anti-blackness as total climate. That's from her book, In the Wake. Uh, three. Compared to the eco-modernist manifesto's many conceptual loopholes, love is the message is laser focused on figurations distorted within actual everyday environments of racial capitalism, 
where climate pol policies impact real people. Indeed, Jaffa's stream of uh, rhythmic edits moves relentlessly through shots of police hitting, pummeling, punching, shooting, and brutalizing black bodies. Visualizing the controlling of distinct climates of life and death premised on anti-blackness, Jaffa includes the 2015 murder of Walter Scott in South Carolina. The abuse of 2014 arrest of Kametra Barber in her car with her four children in Dallas. And the cruel ground tackling of 15-year-old bikini-clad Dejeria Becton by a white police officer at a pool party in McKinney, Texas in 2015. You're probably all familiar with the, and remember these, uh, these spectacular scenes that were captured on, uh, on citizen journalist uh, cell phone cameras and dash cams. So refusing the clear distinctions between environmental management as a mode of carbon capture and temperature modulation on the one hand, and biopolitics as the governance of life and lives on the other, these scenes portray social engineering that unites the management of biophysical conditions and systems of environmental control, which together impacts and exacerbates race, gender, and class inequalities. In other words, modalities of climate control. Elsewhere, Jaffa contextualizes these climates of anti-blackness with additional footage drawn from the historical archive, uh, showing mid-century scenes of police fire-hosing black protesters, striking civil rights activists with nightsticks, as well as shots of whites brutalizing lunch counter protesters in North Carolina, and imagery from D.W. Griffith's <coughs> notorious 1915 film, The Birth of a Nation, with its scandalous portrayals of Ku Klux Klan members and white actors in blackface. In other words, Love is the Message offers a short history, lesson in US climate history, where environment has little to do with protected wilderness zones, global warming, or melting ice. In returning to eco-modernism, the Breakthrough Institute willfully contributes to the widespread invisibility of precisely those scenes Jaffa highlights, divorcing what he termed what, what, what might be termed the black Anthropocene, uh, wherein ecology is inseparable from the social terms of racial capitalism, from its geoengineered future. And, and this is a really interesting development, the black Anthropocene, partly inspired by the, uh, the sci-fi work of Octavia Butler. Um, so this equation is most explicit in the eco-modernism, I'm sorry, in Jaffa's video, where his video includes passages of African Americans wading through uh, the superstorm floodwaters of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, for many New Orleans, years of structural negligence, municipal and infrastructure defunding, systematic racial inequality, and impoverishment were compounded by that unnatural disaster. Unnatural, right, because it was not simply a natural event, but was the impacts were premised upon all of that infrastructural debilitation. Um, so I'm, I'm using Neil Smith's proposal uh, for uh, calling it an unnatural disaster. Uh, taking that context writ large, geoengineering appears to be a technological construct mobilized in part precisely so as not to address social injustice, and to restrict our understanding of environment to the biogeophysical realm. Okay, so that, this is a, there's an implicit critique here of mainstream environmental activism, that it, it's participating in that restriction of our understanding of, of environment to the biogeophysical realm. Showing how police brutality enacts the everyday and sometimes spectacular meanings of US environmental management. Love is the message, in contrast, brings climate control down to the racialized and classed figural scale. We witness how white supremacy, disaster capitalism, and authoritarian neoliberalism operate at granule levels. If those forces have come to res represent Trumpism, uh, then that's because the latter is itself a signature instance of the pathologies of Anthropocene rationality 
and, and this was a hunch I had. I started doing research and found all these articles on, on connecting Trump to the Anthropocene, which is super interesting and I think, I think symptomatic. Okay, four. Even while love is the message, doesn't specifically reference geoengineering, it nonetheless offers a discernible cry of protest against the latter's ambition to sustain, and here's a critique of the term sustainability, to sustain our present culture with no alteration to its governing sociopolitical and economic arrangements, with mitigation technology only intervening at the level of regional weather control and atmospheric waste management. Yet it does propose connections between these diverse facets of reality. By virtue of its montage, Jaffa's video joins passages of black death and police violence to close-up shots of angry sun flares, as seen from NASA's International Space Station's near live feed, thereby establishing a link that resonates with environmental justice positions that view global warming as a threat multiplier that exacerbates social conflict and inequality. According to well-documented research, disenfranchised and impoverished communities of color experience higher levels of exposure to climate-related disasters in their aftermath, like, in, like with Katrina, uh, to food and water shortages, major health risks, and other forms of environmental vulnerability and debility. These factors worsen social conflicts that, in the absence of social service provisions, invite intensified security, even military responses. And, and that's something we're seeing broadly, which connects to what Chad was saying about the Manhattan Project, right? The, the military securitization of climate control is, is one of the really troubling developments that we're witnessing today. In this vein, it's feasible to understand Love is the Message's footage of the aliens dripping secondary jaws from Ridley Scott's 1979 classic, uh, and those of the city-destroying monster from Cloverfield, Matt Reeves' 2008 faux found footage horror film, as further elements of Jaffa's hieroglyphic scaffolding of meaning construction, a rebus of excessive signification serving to elevate the tragic but quotidian documents of police violence and racial oppression to the realm of cosmopolitical significance, the area where worlds are annihilated and remade. In other words, any given, um, any given police attack cannot be seen as a standalone local event, but rather by virtue of Jaffa's stream of collected footage, each forms a part of systematic and widespread violence, and more, that violence becomes a matter of civilizational threat akin to the horror of an alien assault on planet Earth. The monstrous tells a story of global warming driving racial injustice, a narrative of post-natural dystopia resulting from runaway climate change. The monstrous proposes so many film fables that might be read variously as representing the greedy and senseless destruction of the world conducted by the rapacious power of carceral capital, bolstered by police climate control, the colonization of debt, and the chains of spectacle, or the radical and threatening otherness of racial difference become a predatory behemoth. Alternately, a justice-seeking revenge fantasy visited upon white power by what lies beyond recognition, or the, mat the materialization of contemporary fears of a genetically and geoengineered Frankensteinian science in creating post-natural dystopias and runaway climate change, or indeed some element of each all mixed together without articulate or stable meaning. Uh, five, the Breakthrough Institute also re references our, what they call our contemporary Frankenstein. Enlisting no less than uh, Bruno Latour in its theoretical armory, who argues that we must not dis disown the planetary monster we've created, the Earth of the Anthropocene, but rather learn to love and care for it through further technological acts of what he calls modernizing modernization. While Naomi Klein overlooks Latour's subtle call for a compositionalist modernity as a process of becoming ever more attuned 
and intimate with a panoply of non-human natures. She rightly criticizes the presumptuousness of his proposal, especially where it aids in the Institute's pro-engineering agenda. She writes, the earth is not our prisoner, our patient, our machine, or indeed our monster. It's our entire world. And the solution to global warming is not to fix the world. It's to fix ourselves. Adding to mounting opposition to geoengineering, she highlights the multiple problems of the practice, including, and this is a very brief summary of, uh, the, of the critique of geoengineering, so including its, its potential unintended side effects, interfering in monsoons in South Asia, exacerbating drought in North Africa, widening the ozone hole, uh, the lack of any regulatory protocol for climate interventions with transnational implications the lock-in effect that makes it next to impossible to abandon the technology once it's been implemented, its anti-democratic basis in an era of globalism led by a handful of powerful developed nations, and crucially, its directing of precious resources away from the causes of climate disruption in favor of addressing symptoms. Uh, just as an aside, um, the recent IPC uh, report that says we have 12 years before we enter into uh, a new cascade of tipping points, um, and, and it's meant to be a warning, also reiter reiterates the necessity of uh, engaging uh, geoengineering as, as a technological fix. Um, so this is, you know, it's, it's becoming integrated into policy proposals increasingly. Uh, indeed, in recent years, um, as Naomi Klein's book um, exemplifies, uh, Various resistance movements have formed around climate justice, asserting the fundamental principle of system change, not climate change. In other words, we have to change our systems, of, you know, our human systems, instead of allowing, uh, instead of trying to change the world. Um, including the many instances of blockadia throughout Europe and the Americas, where justice means dedication to equality, fairness, and the inclusion of the most vulnerable and frontline communities in the, in the deliberation of climate solutions. Such movements seek to expand justice as a technology. That's a, an interesting proposal by the uh, sci-fi writer Kim Stanley Robinson, who says, who says that justice is a technology. Uh, and dem democracy as a principle of engineering. But despite such momentum and creative transitions, what's becoming clear with the ongoing development of geoengineering is that massive resources and funding bodies are mobilizing the technology under the star of the neoliberal Anthropocene. Consider breakthrough initiatives. Uh, there's no relation to the institute other than sharing this trending term within the field of competitive tech development, which is one among many trying to, in their words, save the planet and motivated in doing so by what some see as a $12 trillion opportunity, funded in part by Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg and Israeli-Russian venture capitalist Yuri Milner of Digital Sky Technologies and counting the late Stephen Hawking among its collaborators. The project recently put $100 million into a radio wave project to search for alien life. Inspired by libertarian entrepreneurialism, that derides the outmoded and bureaucratic state agencies of the Cold War, like NASA. Breakthrough initiatives is part of a growing colonial futurism premised upon the neoliberalization of outer space. It connects to the projects of Silicon Valley's modeling of what's called new space, in, as in the rhetoric of Elon Musk, set on asteroid resource mining, terraforming other planets, and extending property claims far into the galaxy. This is another diagram that I just found online that's useful showing this uh, modern day gold rush. Uh, so with the neoliberal corporate military state complex determined to occupy and settle the very space that many Afrofuturists have long sought as a destination to escape colonized Earth, such starry-eyed fantasies are quickly becoming grim realities. Other engineering initiatives focus their attention on Earth, exemplifying how the neo-colonialist spirit haunts new wave environmentalism. Consider SCOPEX, Harvard University's current $20 million stratospheric controlled perturbation experiment, 
uh, notable for its first ever, and this is really un historically unprecedented, its first ever plans to test solar radiation management technologies outside the lab in the Earth's atmosphere above Arizona, representing a vertical politics of colonization of the atmosphere above lands occupied by settlers long ago, which we heard about from in Will's presentation. <clears throat> Led by David Keith, Harvard professor of applied physics, founder and board member of the private corporation Carbon Engineering, and a signatory of an eco-modernist eco manifesto. The project is supported by Microsoft's Bill Gates and his fund for inno innovative climate and energy research, as well as the Hewlett Foundation and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, an appropriate beneficiary of the latter, considering it's named for the longtime CEO of General Motors. So we're seeing, the, in other words, the transfer of fossil capital into geoengineering technology. One thing I find interesting here uh, in this light is, uh, is uh, the way the Cameroonian uh, theorist Achille Mbembe, uh, based in um, South Africa, in his diagnosis of what he calls the creeping precaritization as, in his words, the becoming black of the world, meaning the post-racial generalization of dispossession, indebtedness, and loss of powers of self-determination that is now reaching global proportions. Uh, and comparing it to geoengineering's desire to save the world by literally whitening the sky. It reveals how completely detached the field is from the catastrophes currently occurring below the, the clouds in the here and now. Uh, six, the go-to guide for Zuckerberg and Gates is Yuval Noah Harari's uh, recent book, Homo Deus. A Brief History of Tomorrow, which tellingly includes a chapter titled The Anthropocene. Driven by an endless quest <clears throat> for bliss, immortality, and divinity, Homo Deus, or Anthropos, in this narrative figures as ultimate self-creator for whom no challenge, climate change, agricultural failure, artificial intelligence, planetary hunger, even death and extinction, will be beyond technological overcoming, especially when matched to Silicon Valley capital. At the same time, the cost will be greater inequality and technocracy, as, uh, as he points out in the book, um, an expand, an, as well as an expanding useless class, a new religion of algorithm, algorithmic datism, and the reduction of humanity to so many biochemical subsystems monitored by global networks. This may already be happening, I think. Uh, more, prosaic, <clears throat> more prosaically, the good or read neoliberal Anthropocene emerges in this and the Breakthrough Institute's narrations as the ideological mechanism of choice for suspending contradictions between economic growth and climate solutions. In fact, even climate changing, uh, sorry, even climate change denying Texas Republicans can get on board with geoengineering as a not-to-be-missed pro-tech economic opportunity, requiring no need to debate sources of environmental transformation or hold petrocapitalism responsible. In the process, causality is sacrificed on the altar of techno-solutionism. While the Trump administration has defied the scientific consensus on climate change and supported fossil fuel deregulations. Its February 2018 budget, supported by many in Congress, included the first ever tax breaks for new technologies of atmospheric carbon capture, a key geoengineering technology. While it's true that this form may be one of the lesser evils, it still does redirect precious funding away from mitigating causes of climate disruption. Meanwhile, the Hoover Institution, the Heartland Institute, and the American Enterprise Institute, all key conservative think tanks support this move, the latter hailing geoengineering as nothing less than a revolutionary approach to climate change. Even more alarming is the current conceptualization by Keith and others <clears throat> of what's called counter geoengineering. This is the counter acting of the militarized weaponization of climate manipulation technologies 
as deployed by imagined rogue states or non-state actors. In other words, what if North Korea developed its own geoengineering program that negatively impacted US interests? How could we counteract it through our counter geoengineering technologies? So this additional danger dramatizes engineering's ungovernable status and potential for destructive instrumentalization in the era of homo deus. Even more than biologically regressive, uh, neo-humanist and universalist, depoliticizing and neo-colonialist, Anthropocene geoengineering is proving most threatening where techno-utopianism merges with military unilateralism in proposing near-future global weather wars going far beyond anything imagined in the Cold War. <clears throat> Se seven. While the horror of, the, of those systems predicated upon everyday acts of violence are devastatingly presented in Love is the Message, Jaffa also powerfully intercuts passages portraying the remarkable resilience, accomplishment, and beauty of African American culture, despite all in activism and politics, speculative imagination, rhetoric, music, dance, literature, athletics, and profoundly quotidian acts of creativity. The negative and the positive, love and death, repeatedly and relentlessly oscillate and converge in explosive combination in his audio-visual construction, proposing something like a singular vine compilation of cutting philosophical import or an Instagram feed of alternately soul-destroying and restorative affects. Jaffa terms it the abject sublime an extraordinary mix of beauty and horror, issuing from an archive of black visual culture that seems infinite in its range of experiences. For the filmmaker, this ultimately beyond quantifiable record of being stems from an ontological construction inseparable from the wake of transatlantic slavery. Indeed, the video's description defying vastness its overwhelming multivalence is signaled in Greg Tate's appropriately transgressive grammar used in characterizing the piece. He writes, the, the viral outgrowth of an aborted found footage exercise, the seven minute video is an alternately mirthful come melancholic come cardiac arresting meditation on race agency wrapped up in a visually sem uh, sermonic recitation of race tragically wrapped in a nuanced and feverish exaltation of diverse black American lives at various states of collapse and regeneration. It's hard to say. <clears throat> Yet even though the video offers an amazing and startling account of generative ambivalence mixed with creative survival, and even while it gives rise to ex encompassing hopefulness in collective moments of love, solidarity, ethical conviction, and collective justice seeking, it simultaneously obliterates any consideration of extending or sustaining its world of horror, one of beyond grotesque inequality, impoverishment, and violence that renders black life and lives matterless by the state and its techno-human apparatuses. Unlike the Breakthrough Institute, which proffers art and leisure as rewards, Jaffa's video grounds cosmopolitical magnitude within the vernacular instances of justice and injustice, of situated and embodied expressions that may be future-oriented but are historically informed, dedicated to the reinvention of everyday life, art, culture, politics, mourning, and militancy. It follows, then, that Jaffa would extend solidarity to a younger generation by including uh, reference to the artist Martine Sims and her uh, 2015 mundane Afrofuturist manifesto, In Love is the Message. During her cameo appearance, she reads from her statement, which reprises the long-standing black cultural aesthetic that draws on visions of a utopian time to come, but one reached only by passing through the traumatic alienations of racial capitalism. In other words, a mundane futurism founded in worldly experience, where no simple time travel or easy shape-shifting is possible, especially if it means escaping from reality. 
In this regard, mundane Afrofuturists recognize that we are not aliens, Sims explains, while facing the camera seated behind a desk. Jaffa borrows the clip from Sims' eponymous documentary, which over the course of its hour-long duration eschews what its author sees as <clears throat> the depoliticized fantasies of past Afrofuturisms. You, you can find this online as well. According to Sims, those have sunk into hackneyed fashions, commodifiable styles, and stale pop cultural spectacles severed from any radical imagination inspiring collective liberation today. This, I think, is arguable, but that, that this is, that's her position. Uh, more, she warns against a critical seduction, as when, quote, magic interstellar travel and or the wondrous communication grid lead to an illusion of outer space and cyberspace as egalitarian. And I think we've already seen how that's increasingly not the case. For her, again in her words, jive-talking aliens and reference to Sun Ra and Egyptian mythology and iconography, all, all common in past Afrofuturist iterations, are all out, calling instead for a new focus on black humanity. Our science, technology, culture, politics, religion, individuality, needs, dreams, hopes, and failings, where undane, uh, sorry, mundane Afrofuturism is the ultimate laboratory for world building outside of imperialist, capitalist, white patriarchy. That's the crucial quote, I think. While love is the message expresses potential solidarity with the oppressed and excluded, both human and non, Sims' sentiment rejects equivalence between racial difference and the monstrous. The result is expressive of what Arya Dean diagnoses as the conjunction of black accelerationism and Afrofuturism that entails both the catalytic movement toward the end of the world, right, in order to halt injustice, and a revolution beyond the humanisms or inhumanisms of racial capitalism by inventing new forms of life, new futures, new desires. In other words, a young generation has elected to update Afrofuturism, asking us, asking us to witness a double move that rhymes negative critique with positive transformation, a rhythm that Jaffa takes up in turn. Eight. The challenge here, for me, is bringing this vision of social critique and social liberation into explicit connection, and more importantly, direct conflict with the neoliberal Anthropocene, and to oppose the threat of anti-black climate control, especially as those eco-modernist agendas are intent on shaping the world to come in ways that will not only set us on a trajectory of unstoppable climate transformation, but also interminably extend racial injustice. Against that scenario, we urgently need to invent and cultivate futures beyond the world's end, beyond the world of engineering, as well as beyond the world's end that may have already occurred, as in indigenous conceptions, and where that end is no longer unthinkable beyond current sociopolitical and economic arrangements. This includes thinking beyond the technofixes of sustainability and of sustaining injustice. If so, and in conclusion, why should cultures outside Afrofuturism, which, remain, which may remain comfortably shielded by whiteness and the current narratives and technologies that uphold and defend its position, why should they care? One answer is to reiterate, reiterate the desirable terms of a shared world where injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Expressing a future-oriented imperative with new politico-ecological purpose, Fred Moten, in a recent public conversation with Robin D.G. Kelly, updated that famous ethical-political formulation of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, it should be noted, makes a notable appearance in Jaffa's video. He posits that this is uh, Moten, that the mission of contemporary black studies as on the most fundamental level to try to save the earth, and on a secondary level to save the possibility of human existence. 
Kelly adds that this is a project for liberation, a transformative project. And if it doesn't exist as a response to the neoliberal, neo-fascist turn, then it's worthless, Kelly says. Why should this project for liberation not also be the overarching imperative of artistic practice today? And if so, and I believe firmly that it should, then art will name the practice of creative aesthetics that merges ecological insight with political engagement in the hopes of not only saving what good we have, but securing a flourishing and an emancipated future for all. Thank you. saying, uh, I found the discussion of counter geoengineering interesting because um, there are two conflicts that are happening at the moment that exploit climatic um, issues. And one is the sanctions in Iran, uh, which we've just imposed, which is going to threaten or, or uh, weaponize the, the drought issues there. Uh, and another is uh, the US supporting of the bombing of Yemen and the kind of medieval style famine that that's producing. These are actually weaponizations of climatic conditions. And of course, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as you'd well know, a lot of this revolves around uh, not only territorial dispossession, but also issues to do with resources, water in particular, um, in that part of the world. Even though the focus is often on oil in the Middle East, there is this other question as well. So uh, if people have any questions at this point, yes. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I wondered, well, a couple things. One of my impressions when you were talking about geoengineering was first, have they never read a science fiction novel? And so, uh, so expounding upon both your very last point and your use of art and film and narrative throughout your talk that you keep referring to, and thinking back to this morning's panel, um, particularly uh, Christina Seely's discussion of photography and Christy Harner's discussion of narrative, can you expound a little bit more on this vision, how the arts can be used to present this alternative conception of the future? Sure, thank, thank you for that. Um, well, I think <coughs> maybe to narrow the question down a little bit to what I'm trying to do here, because uh, I think that the arts broadly conceived and practiced can do like a number, many things, you know, like in, innumerable things uh, in terms of just uh, inventing creative alternatives, providing critical representations, and most ambitiously uh, inventing new forms of life um, that are founded on justice and ecological flourishing. So, um, but I think what, what I find really important here with Jaifa's contribution to the discussion is how it intervenes. It makes a double intervention. On the one hand, uh, it allows us to show the, um, the justice bankruptcy of certain kinds of engineering approaches and the lack of attention to um, what's happening more broadly within um, forms of, you know, Govern governmentality of inequality, say, on the one hand, and on the other, um, to try to, I think it's, it, there's an important opportunity here to, talk, to expand our understanding of what environment means. And for me, within the arts, um, uh, I sometimes have even often a, a little bit of a frustration when the, the discussion is limited to the non-human world. Um, I'm not, I don't mean to be critical of any practices specifically at all. I think there, there's really crucial and important work to be done exploring, uh, say, multi-species being or uh, post or non-anthropocentric ways of seeing and uh, appreciating and, and coming to care and cultivating practices of care uh, in relationship to what lies beyond uh, human existence. Um, so I'm not trying to be critical here, but, but often like we're, we're confronting today, I think within art writing and art practice, exhibition making, 
the tendency to create a new kind of niche world, which is called eco-art. And I find it really frustrating because it, it ends up almost like, un, it's unintentional, but it ends up uh, continuing the very separations that have gotten us into this dilemma or this, this, uh, this crisis in the first place. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so absolutely, yeah. So there's, there's a, sometimes there can be um, a tendency to, to violate the, the progressive <laughs> conceptual poss possibilities of what ecology is as a science of connectivity or, or ra let's say, radical relationality uh, by shutting down the, the images and stories and discussions and discourse and theory so that it's just about the, the non-human. So I think JFA, for me, at this point right now, it's, it's, a, it's really crucial to intervene, not only in, with the easy target, the neoliberal Anthropocene and, and geoengineering, but also within um, you know, cultural narratives um, that, that tend to reproduce, again, unintentionally, uh, what's, what's been called an ecology of affluence or a white environmentalism. So I, I, I share that, that frustration with the unbearable whiteness of green that Van Jones has talked about, that, that Leslie Green, the South African um, environmental humanist, has mentioned as well. Lots of people are talking about that. So I think that's, um, it's, it's really important to shift the discourse here. Can I, I'm just going to ask a follow-up. Um, when you're thinking about that piece that you shared that's obviously incredibly powerful, how do you envision it in situ? Like, at, at how is the public experiencing it in conversation with this bigger topic? Because you just showed it to us here in this lecture, and we're already talking about all of these other issues. Yeah. So I'm just curious in terms of all these entryways into this bigger conversation, how, yeah, just what your thoughts are and how, what's the ideal way of positioning that kind of piece to do the work you want it to do or, or that it can do? Sure, yeah, I don't think yeah. there's an ideal way. I think there's many sure, ways. Sure, so sure. I, I would support you know, multiplicity over any kind of prescriptive I idealism for sure. Uh, but I think generally it's, it's, uh, it's shown in gallery situations and um, often, I, from what I see, the discourse is, lim is kind of limited to uh, African American social justice uh, critiques and, and grievances, and you know it, it speaks to that powerfully and importantly, and so that's one um, a frame of, of reference that's really crucial. Uh, and I, I wouldn't, I'm not trying to criticize that, but I'm, I'm, am, I am finding resources within, as I mentioned, uh, Black Lives Matter where they're creating and, and continuing with the theorization and practice of, of uh, intersectionality. Yeah. Intersectionality comes out of like Kimberly Crenshaw uh, and many other people working within African American civil rights activism um, that, that insists on thinking of the forces of, uh, of injustice and violence like race and gender together in relationship to uh, politics and, and grievance claims and, and uh, and law as well. But one thing that's often left out, I know you're, you want to say something no. more, but one thing that's yeah. left out is <laughs> ecology, right? Yes, yes. So how can we develop um, an intersectionality that is also extends to uh, ecology and the non-human in terms of, let's say, a multi-species justice um, activism? And Movement for Black Lives is doing that. There's, there's references there. And I'm, I found that quote that I ended with Fred Moten, for instance, really interesting because he's bringing it up too. So it's so, you know, with, within African American uh, um, theorizations of, of politics that JFA's video clearly supports, there's also small entrances here and there into that kind of project of expanding intersectionality to the ecological realm. Yeah, I mean, and I, I'm asking actually because I, I, if I had seen that in an exhibition, I would assume it would have been positioned in a very different kind of conversation. And because you're positioning it in this conversation, this whole new kind of avenue is opened up that I think is really powerful and wonder. That's why I'm asking in if there's this ideal, maybe even within a museum context, if it's help, you know, it's it's part of a bigger conversation yeah. around the Anthropocene and ecological issues. That's a whole new way of then entering into that conversation that I yeah. think is what you're interested in and becomes yeah. activated within this bigger conversation. That's yeah. kind of why I, I'm bringing it up because yeah. we might not get there without your help and what, how could it be positioned yeah. in the art world to, to have that 
that power, I guess, or that yeah, impact. My, just one follow up. I, I, my, I would want to ask not how it can be ideally positioned within the art world, because my, my intuition would say that the art world will kill it, basically. <laughs> and the, art, the museum is idealist as a space of idealism, and that's part of the problem. So I, so I think I would be interested in looking rather for you know, ways to uh, extend, extend the discussion and have these conversations uh, in other places outside of uh, the museum, which I've kind of, unfortunately, I, I, I see it's really, I feel like it's really hard to have much um, confidence in um, art exhibitions and the, and the kind of presentations that happen there. Uh, for sure. Well, I mean, I think that's part of the whole bigger conversation is it's like how to build out the animal. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's multiple. So our, we're artists are functioning in that world. So I'm yeah. just, I can't help but get back to like, as an artist dealing with these issues, yeah. I have to function on some level within that world and also think about how to build out that network of how art can function both within that system and break open that system and change yeah. that system. And I'm sure you're. So uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're aware that right the art the, the art world isn't a world right. There's many worlds or there's many systems. And well, so, we can get into semantics, but you know I think yeah. you know what I mean no, about I it because we're all doing the same. We're all trying to work this out. So it's it's interesting yeah. having this like you know layered. How do we break into another way to have conversations yeah. that intersect all of this too? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you very much, TJ. All right, thank you. Uh,